third-person action-adventure game set in a world attacked by magical poison ivy that looks like giant's testicles. And the only way to save everybody is by hiring a mid-level druid to kick the crap out of Casper while leading a Pikmin-style army of cooing oil splotches into battle with them. That's Kena Bridges Spirits by Ember Labs for $40 coming out for PC and PS5. Subscribe to the channel if you like reviews that aren't filled with sponsored bullcrap. The game is phenomenal looking, which is weird for me to say right after saying no sponsored bullcrap because it may sound sponsored, but it isn't. It's not just the vistas you pass across these mountain ranges as your Girl Scout leading your huge big band of jelly bean gremlins behind you. The real work here is how everything actually fits together. The rots running around, at least 90% eyeball scampering into items or perching on top of eaves and trooping along behind you. It gives you this childish energy to everything that you do. Even when you hear the crack of thunder and the world flashes one last time before darkness descends into a forest, you know, hey, you know what? I'm going in with my band behind me. The violence of that rainstorm, the heavy downpour soaking in those bad memories of a spirit that's taken over the area and is still chasing family members it's lost, feeds directly into the fiction, though, and makes this off-center narrative actually work. Sometimes it has you following along as these lost spirits call out for loved ones. Other times it's just interspersed with more thoughtful, almost playful moments directing the rot to help you explore the world or unlock some new location. It spans out into massive platforming moments with you trying to figure out how to get to the highest tree or around some poison alley so deep in the infection that it doesn't make sense to even try to take it on head first. As with the forest location I just described, a good deal about Kina's look is the excellent lighting. Noticeable right from the start as you walk through the cavern and with each step, her face is illuminated just a bit by that soft light of the crystal or the red corruption of enemies as they come out of the ground. Kina's use of color work means that obstacles such as the forest dead zones are desaturated down to almost nothing more than that corrupt and pulsating red, losing the vibrancy and the color of the normal forest. And then as you defeat the enemies, that saturation comes back. Something that we've seen in other games like Saboteur, but visually it works incredibly well. The cutscenes everybody's seen, it is profoundly beautiful. There are small graphical elements in the gameplay though that I was surprised to see, like a lucky rot leaping on the top of your head to stay out of the water when you swim through a pond. And the other trying to catch up to you, or when you meditate in locations you've saved and all around you, the rock creatures end up falling asleep or doing their own things, a gaggle of tuckered out tykes just waiting for you to get up and lead them to go do something again, their jelly bean siesta finally over. These small animations and the way everything is designed allows for the game to sort of feel like something we haven't seen before. And in many ways, it actually reminds me a little bit of the ancient bygone days of something like Beyond Good and Evil. But like those ancient games, this game does have a couple issues. For example, the cutscenes are locked at 30 FPS, or at least feel like that. And while they still look excellent, especially when it comes to art design, that is still a momentary distraction. Also, you'd think someone going out there to save everyone from dispossessed spirits would probably limber up, do a little bit of stretching first. She isn't the most mobile of main characters in her animations for jumping and leaping. I love her running animation, though. It's one of those, I gotta get there as quick as possible kind of anime runs, where at the top of the run with each knee raise, there's a bit of a momentary pause, and it gives that sort of jerkiness to a character that's just got places to be. And while I was talking about bad things, I got to bring up one other good thing, though. The later battle has you fighting a minion created from a dude corrupted by this evil magic. And the animation, as he jerks and jolts into being encased in about 500 pounds of Arbor Day armor, it just comes sprinting at you. And there's this awesome feeling of weight. And speaking of waiting, you're going to have to wait for a better video card to play this. No. With all the settings on Ultra, except for post-processing and volumetric fog, the 2080 was well above 60 at 4K. The 1080 could hit 1440p at the same. One thing to be aware of is that both post-processing and fog hit the FPS pretty damned hard without a real big noticeable difference in their performance sparing opportunities versus graphics. I was surprised how the game ran because the draw distance, if set to ultra, spans out miles. And while it's not exactly drawing in enemies at 2,000 paces, it's still showing a huge amount of the real estate much of the time. And when it's doing that, it looks one part painting, one part nature documentary, well, also done in oil paints. A fantastic looking game. It's got some issues here and there and occasional drops in frame rate for, let's say, a load. But overall, it's phenomenal looking and I love the design.
intense suffering here, spirit. Do you need help? You know nothing of suffering. This is my and admittedly, most of the audio design is also very good. If you play this on a surround sound with a receiver or any other 4.1 or above system, you're going to be rewarded. The audio is incredible, especially environmentally. The forest sounds, the creaking and groaning of the different trees around you as you explore. Be aware that combat isn't especially sprawling across these huge areas. So while it does help you a bit in combat, the audio envelope is a bit more engaging as a supplement for the exploration than some supreme requirement for the combat system. Hit sounds and stingers and environments are all meted out well, regardless if you're using 2.1 headphones or true multi-channel surround. An issue I did have in a couple cutscenes, it didn't seem to switch over and it didn't play the voices. It seems like those cutscenes might just be in stereo and the system had a bit of an issue there. I'm going to chalk that up to possibly Windows instead of the game. Voices are excellent, though I would say Kina isn't really replete with a huge number of characters, so it's not necessarily surprising. Kina's voiced well, has to be the highlight there, but the voice actors for the children are phenomenal. This is notoriously difficult in video games to get kids' voices right. They usually can't act yet, or it's adults pretending to be kids, and it feels more like a Chris Hansen moment than a Jim Henson moment. That fat cheek sound that kids have when they're excited about something when they're young fleshes out perfectly across the board. Musically, though, man, what a surprise. It mixes Bali's musical traditions with more orchestral elements from big-budget movies than I ever could have expected. Battles beaten down to just percussion and the occasional string section. The game's often multi-layered use of vocals helps this tremendously. It adds this spiritual, ethereal feeling to almost all of the tracks it plays. It really does bridge the gap between expected game music and traditional music that we don't expect, but that reflect wherever the game is trying to get some of its spiritual drawings. And that's what we see here. Very well done. Speaking of very well done, let's talk about gameplay and the story and see if they are. First, it's best to go into Kena knowing what's offered. That question's always raised. What does a game offer when I'm entering into contested environments and genres such as a 3D platformer slash action adventure game? This is usually followed by people trying to tell you that you might as well just play some old classic game instead of buying something new. Brain injuries aside, this is a good question, and Kina is offering something that isn't shockingly different from a lot of other games. Instead, what it delivers, though, is a profoundly focused expectation and delivery across the board. The story itself isn't completely unknown. It's a girl with the ability to commune with dead spirits. She comes to the aid of a village that's been set upon by this darkness that has taken over the land. Kina is a spirit guide, and in this world, masks are created for the dead, and as they pass into the spirit world, the masks will crumble into dust. If they don't, then a spirit guide can help them out. And yes, that means exactly what you think. Help the tormented souls by beating the shit out of them like a five-foot staff wielding extra in Ghostbusters. And if that doesn't work, you can always sick your goofy troop of Pikmin legless freaks behind you onto them as well. And to get to those enemies and see what enemies you're going to get, the game starts out with each location opening up like tributaries, hubs from that center location, which is a village that occasionally you are going to return to for quests as well as story progression. Now, Kina starts out platforming mostly from location to location and opening up new spaces by interjecting and figuring out ways in which physical puzzles with skills that you have can be worked together. One of the first things that you end up learning is the burst ability. This is the ability to shoot out your spirit and act activate various stones in the game world. These sometimes have to be done in order. Sometimes they're not where they're supposed to be and other little physical intricacies that you'll find. Kina is also equipped with a staff that has light and heavy attacks, and you can also lock on or not lock on depending on what you want to. There's also multiple different difficulties you can choose. As you work through the locations figuring things out, you gain experience that you can end up spending on different moves, as well as gathering more members of the Rot, which is basically a team of creatures that you can use to help you in the game world. Each one of them also plays out in their own cutscene when you get them, and there's a ton. I think that show of polish was something I wasn't expecting. And while you can use them to battle, for the most part, you're going to be using your staff, your bow, or others. When you jump in to buy these skills, there's only a couple. You have your shield, and later on you get the bow, as well as the ability to manifest your power into spiritual attacks. The upgrades, there's not a lot. Adding the ability to transform the staff into a hammer, or slow down time with the bow, or use a quick counter parry. It's not exactly new territory, but it works for this character. And those moves work well enough, especially in coordination with the rot and what they can do. You can stun, for instance, enemies with them, which might help you get an arrow shot into a huge weakness 
that cripples the boss for a good deal of damage or might end up saving your life as you go to try to heal. In and out of battle, puzzle work is a big part of Kena, start to finish. And while it's not exactly masterworks, a couple of them did take me a bit of thinking or looking at the game world, figuring out the timing for something or the rhythm. As Kena grows in powers, you can interact with more stuff around the game world as well. Things we've seen before. There's just something excellent about the humorous way in which they move. For example, when they grab a stone and they wobble around as they all try to direct it. Or the fact that when you're telling them where to bring something and you end up marking it in the game world, then another one of the rot will actually go to that spot and wave back at them. It's awesome. You can also clear out sections of the game world, and when you do so, they turn into this huge slug, and you can actually see all of them sort of swimming around. Ideally, you can also buy them different hats. As you explore the game world, you unlock them. If that's for you, that's cool. For me, I wasn't too excited about gathering a new hat, though, admittedly, I sort of did like the pineapple hats. So at the starting, you have your shield, but that's also your parry ability just shortened. We've seen that before. But also here, it's how you burst out power into the world and affect the stones and open up doors. Your bow and arrow is gauged on your spirit. It needs to actually recharge between groups of attacks, but it's also just an extension of the ability you're already aware that you have. The same thing with your exploding bombs that you can end up using later. Also, where there aren't that many types of enemies, most of them are varieties of different vegetation that has been corrupted by this. You could use all these special abilities on the enemies, of course, but I liked the way they played. They did actually offer differences in how you ended up having to face them. And when a boss shows up on the harder difficulty, those guys ain't no joke. But was it fun while I did it? Yes, it was. It's enjoyable in the way I was actually hoping Kena would be. It's that relaxed bit where you're just moving from spot to spot, figuring out a puzzle, offering up enemies until that mini boss shows up and pounds you back into an old save game. The enjoyment here for me was the exploring. It was figuring out a new puzzle. It was going to a new location, looking at a spot and saying, how do I get there? And knowing that I could because you see some visual cues. And then once you get there, that satisfaction of doing so. Taking out enemies on the harder difficulty, especially some of the bosses, is not easy and getting through it, exploring, finding some new item was much more rewarding than I expected it to be. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, rent, or never touch again rating system. 40 bucks, it's a blast, well worth it. It's a fantasy forest revival of the Overlords game in a weird way, except here you aren't dealing with cranky ass goblins that are seven days unwashed. You're dealing with this cute, not of this world kind of creatures. I love that. The battle was pretty good, but the exploration, moving around, and some of the different story beats and that music hit it off. Just phenomenal music. So that's it for me. Subscribe to the channel if I've saved you any money or maybe warned you about a bad game. Check out the patron. Peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week, which will include this Friday, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, when you can join us on the podcast to roll out your week with a bunch of stupid gamers. Peace out.